All right, welcome everyone to our first PK8 workshop of the year. You guys have already heard us up here doing tech support and stuff, so I am Justin. I am a Pico 8 developer. I've been working with this engine for about three to four years, although I've been making games a lot longer. And so a lot of you here probably haven't used Pico 8 before, I'm assuming. So what is Pico 8? It is just a fantasy console, which means it emulates a real game console, but it's purely software only. And it's specifically designed to emulate a lot of the limitations of early, like, 1980s, 16-bit consoles and whatnot. But um, it is specifically designed to only emulate their creative limitations. You don't have to worry about, like, memory management or other boring stuff like that. You can literally just sit down, start typing, and it will be uh, turned into a game really quickly. And so I've been reminded that I should probably show off some of my games. That is not the button to do that in this here is a game that I have made. It's called Blast Through. And there's no audio. Can you make it full screen? Yes. As full screen as it can be. And so it is just a really simple game where you play as a little white disc that is under fire from cannons. And as time goes on, you get more points and more cannons get added onto the field. And it's just a matter of how long you can dodge them all. Can you hold it yep. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a lot of things that you can do with Pico 8 because the screen size you can see is very tiny. It's only 128 by 128 pixels. But if you want, you do have complete control over each of those pixels. But there's also a lot of inbuilt drawing functions you can use for sprites and stuff. So it's very versatile in the way you want to actually display stuff. I'm using a few different methods of displaying things throughout this game. And then to give you an idea of what more um, polished games could look like, that's not the right button either. I can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> I have way too many here. It's because I think you minimized the by accident. Yeah. You can get s oh, your windows in the top right corner. OK. Anyway, that's... and you present it. I've not used Max before. I've yes. used Pico 8, but not Max. <laughs> Anyways, so for some other games that other people have made that might be even more polished than my game in different ways, we have, first off, a game a lot of you have probably heard of, Celeste. This is the big Pico 8 game. This was actually the origin of Celeste. It started out as a Pico 8 game and then later became a full published release on Steam. And in the full Steam release, you can actually find the full Pico 8 version hidden within the game. Yes. I believe, I forget what engine they used for Pico 8. I think. What do you mean for Celeste? For yeah, for the full version of Celeste. Yeah. It's like a wet engine. Yeah. Know, mm -hmm. It certainly wasn't Pico 8, though, but yes. But I mean, the developers like this engine. They even came back a few years later to make a Celeste 2. Nice. Yeah, so that's a really cute thing. Some other games, there's this really cool one called Just One Boss. It is, as the name implies, a simple fight against a single boss fight, but it is incredibly well done. The boss has a bunch of different phases that get progressively harder and harder, and it feels really polished of an experience. There is UFO Swamp Odyssey, which is a little Metroidvania. You um, explore around the swamp and collect power-ups and um, eventually unlock new secrets and fix your crashed spaceship. Metroidvanias are really cool because Pico 8 has an inbuilt map editor. Again, you've only got so big you can make the map, but you can do a lot of creative things within those constraints. And I'll teach you how to do some of those things. And then finally, there's D makes, like Pico Hot, <laughs> which is as the name. Yeah. It's very, a lot of, a very popular project that a lot of people do on Pico 8 is to pick an already published game and create a much smaller version of it in Pico 8. And then the other thing you can see right here is, um, this is obviously a 3D game. And it's not actual 3D, there is no inbuilt 3D libraries in Pico 8, it's just using a lot of clever mathematical tricks and graphical tricks in order to make it look like it's 3D. And this is a really complicated thing. Even I haven't fully mastered this, but if I have mastered this, then we are going to get a lesson on it. And so hopefully that's the fingers crossed big stretch goal for us. <laughs> yes. 
I don't know if that's going to be deferred workshop. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> All right. So that is, I think, enough talking from me. So now it is time to start coding. As you can see, the game that we're going to make here, it's a bit more humble than the other games that you've seen. Just a simple game where you can move around and collect some pickups and stuff. But it should introduce the basics of Pico 8 and what it can do. And so, um, is everybody here already on the Pico 8 Education Edition site? Every, uh, go search Pico 8 Education Edition. It should be the first link you can work with and code Pico 8 right in the browser. I don't want to touch this again because I. Don't. There it is. Here's the website. Go to this website. All right. Then, let us begin. So, basic interface of Pico 8. You should be all on this screen. This is your command line interface. You've got all your basic command line stuff. You can type help to see a list of commands. Um, you can use ls to browse the file system. We won't need to do a lot of that right now. This is just for in the future, if you've got a bunch of different games, you can navigate between them with this. The main thing we want to do is press the escape key on your keyboard. This should pull up the code editor screen, which looks like this. This is where you can do some edits to the code. You can make it do whatever you want, like print, I don't know, hello, oops, hello world. Basic Pico 8 stuff, basic literally any programming language stuff. And if you hit escape to close out of the editor view and go back to command line view and type run, then it will run whatever code you have there. So again, really easy to just make something and immediately test it and see what happens. So obviously this isn't a full game, it just did a single command and exited out. And so in order to do the full game, we have to get into the game loop. So there are three basic functions that Pico 8 looks for as reserved functions. Init, update, and draw. And this is the Lua function syntax. Instead of using curly braces, it uses end to denote the end of a function. So if you've worked with Lua before, this should be relatively familiar. If not, the first page of the cheat sheets in front of you has a bunch of different syntax for basic Lua commands. So you could reference that if you ever get confused about what's happening on screen. And the underscores in front of these function names are important. That's how the game makes sure that these are special functions. And so you've probably guessed what these functions do by their name, but init just when the program is initialized as soon as it starts running it will run everything in the init function update is called once every 30 frames and that's where you put your code to update the game's logic and then draw is also call called with update for the most part update and draw are similar but because draws can be graphically intensive if a draw wouldn't be finished in time it would just skip that frame so it would skip the draw but not the update so realistically best practices is you always put your logical stuff in update and you only put the drawing code in draw. So let's make a character and start having the character move around. We'll need um, two variables for the character of course. We'll just call them px and py. And yep, yeah, the screen is 128 by 128 pixels. So if we set each of these variables to 64, then that should default our character's position right in the middle of the screen. And then um, we need code to move the character. Actually, let's just draw the character first, just to see what happens. Um, there's two ways to draw the character. I'll go over both of them right now. First way is just to literally, like I was showing on the little gif that we had, draw a circle. And so Pico 8 has a bunch of different drawing commands. Like on the first reference sheet, you've got shapes right here. And that's where it will be like what sort of shapes you can do. So circ fill draws a filled circle. And we want our x and y positions to be the player x and player y. Color. Each color has a number from 0 to 15. You can see that in the color palette on the top corner. Pico 8 is really restrictive with the amount of colors you can use. So these are the only 15, 16 colors you can use to make the games. So each game has a really unique visual identity that's really unique to Pico 8 games. 
So we'll just draw like a white circle, for example. That's color seven. No, wait, my bad. Radius first. Uh, radius, we'll do three. That's three pixels radius. That's relatively small. And then um, color seven. And then the other thing to note is that Pico 8 doesn't automatically clear the screen every frame. You can do that manually yourself, but you can choose not to do it. Like in my Blast Room game that I made, I'm intentionally only clearing certain parts of the frame each frame, certain parts of the screen each frame, in order to create those trails of pixels behind everything. But just for this game, we'll just do a CLS, which is clear screen and zero in order to clear it with a black color. So that will, every frame, clear the screen with a black color and draw the character, in this case, just dead center on the screen. So if we hit escape and type run, then it should do exactly that, which is very not interesting, but it's progress. <laughs> All right. So the other way that we can, is everybody good with that? Did everybody follow along with that? If you have any questions, just ask me. You can put any color you want for either of those numbers, as long as it's between 0 and 15. Technically, you could use any values outside of that, but like 16 would just wrap back around to 0. Oh, it wraps around. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how do I do escape? Um, hit escape to go back into the command line mode. I see. Oh, it's Yep. Okay. All right. And then the other way we can draw a character is with the sprite editor. You can see that there's a few different tabs up here at the top of the screen. Um, these five right here are going to be the main tabs you, we look at, which is the code tab, the sprite tab, the map, sound effects, and music. We're mostly just going to work with these two tabs today, which is code and sprites. Pico 8 has four different sprite sheets. Each one can hold up to 32 sprites. The first one is a reserved blank sprite, so you shouldn't overwrite that. But we can start from the second one and create whatever sprite we want. So like, for example, you can just go here and start drawing in this box with like whatever you want. OK. So if you've got a sprite, and as you've probably noticed, the sprites have to be an 8x8 eight eight screen. Although you can create bigger sprites, it would just use up more of the sprite sheet. Oh, yeah, can you go under like all the mm -hmm. buttons up? Oh, okay, um, buttons real quick. Um, obviously, you've got your color selector up here. This controls pen size, so you can like increase the pen size to make bigger splotches of color. Um, this one is how big of a canvas you're working with at once, so that just makes it easier to work with larger sprites. It doesn't do anything mechanically to the sprite, it's just ease of access editing-wise. These are your flags. We're probably not going to go over them today, but like, they're useful for when we get into the map stuff. So like, for example, if I were to, say, draw a piece of ground or whatnot, then I could set flag zero to true, and then I'd write in my code, if the player's colliding with anything that has flag zero set to true, treat that as a solid object. Okay. So that's what those are used for. Kind of like different variables or attributes. Yeah, yep, and you've only got a limited amount of those, I think eight. And then down here are your drawing tools, you've got your basic pencil, um, your clone stamp, you can copy and paste stuff. This is what you can use to select stuff, so like I can hit copy, and then use the stamp to paste it somewhere else. This allows me to drag the screen around, and it even goes between the sprites in some cases. This is your fill tool, and this is your shape tool. You can click it repeatedly to toggle between drawing circles, rectangles, and lines, and if you hold down control as you draw something, it will draw in a, oop, my pen size is still really big. If you hold down control, it will make it a filled in circle. And then these are just the three different tabs of sprite sheets, four different tabs of sprite sheets that you can access. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so now that we've got a sprite, we can go back to the code and we can add it in. In Lua, you use comets with two dashes in front of something. Or you can type control B and it will immediately comment out the entire selection. Yep. 
So that's just um, so we can get that later if we want that. But in order to draw our sprite, we will use the SPR function. The first value is going to be the sprite index. So if your sprite is right here, then the sprite index is 1. So we do sprite 1, and then at position PX, PY. And then those are the only mandatory things for sprite. So if we hit run, then we've got our sprite. Yep. One minor thing to note. Yep. One minor thing to note, if I just uncomment it so we do both of these things at once, you'll notice that the circle is drawn with the center at 64, 64, but the sprite is drawn with its top left corner at that same position. So if you can, like, obviously you can manually take care of that yourself by adding, like, a minus 4 to each of these values, and then now it's more or less centered. It's not terribly important in this case, but, like, when we start getting into it, if you're having like weird collision issues, then that might be one of the reasons. It's something to keep in mind. Is it negative four because we know that the sprite is eight by eight? Yes, so half of it would be four. So we move it up half its width and height, then that takes care of it. Okay, now let's get started with moving this character around. And movement is really easy. In order to get player inputs, you have this function, btn and you just give it in a number like zero, and that will return true if you're holding the left button, and false if not. And then you can see up in the top right corner of the Pico 8 cheat sheet which numbers go to which. However, there is another really cool thing we can do for this. If you hold shift while typing anything, it will bring up a special character, like shift T is like a well, time hourglass or something, shift H is a heart, but if you hit shift L, then that will give a specific left arrow, and that actually works as the left arrow for this function. And then the same thing for R, U, D, and then O and X for the two buttons. So you can use the numbers provided, or you can use shift plus the direction. And again, that would be the letter corresponding to the direction, so this would be L on your keyboard to get that. Is that working on Education Edition? Because I haven't actually tested it there. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And then in order to do anything with that, we'll need to put that in an if statement. Everyone here has programming experience and knows what if statements are. Yep. So Lua, if statements, there's two ways to write them. There's if, btn, L then so this is one way to do that and you can do just minus equals two in order to make it move left two spaces but a much easier way to do that since we only want to write a single line of code in our if statements is to use parentheses which like for example This is a single line if statement in Lua. So for cases like this, you can save a bunch of lines that way. And it just makes everything look a lot nicer. Wouldn't it be negative equals? Um, for left, it would be negative equals. For right, it would be plus equals. The top left corner is 0, 0 for this engine. And then you can do the same thing for y. Okay, there is no switch statements in Lua. That's one of the things I really wish the language had, but unfortunately we don't have access to that. Yep, so you do need to just manually type everything out like this. And um, why yeah. is it um, mm -hmm. if then by update? You don't have to do that for any of them. I could. I was just explaining that these are two equally valid ways to do if statements. The main advantages are the top one obviously is the full way of doing it and it can support multiple lines of code in there. The bottom one can only have one line of code immediately after it, but much more compact. Question, does the manually 
You have to manually save these things, yes. I believe for the education edition, if you type in save, then it will immediately like download it onto your computer, and then you'll need to re-upload it later. How about for this? For that one, if you type save, it will just save it to the folder I created for you. Yep. And then if you also type like um, uh, save day one demo, then you can save it with a particular name. Yes. So why not everybody save their work now just so we don't lose everything? Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> okay. And then theoretically, we got everything to work directions wise. So if I type run and I start using the arrow keys, we can move a character around. Oh, wait. Can you go off screen? Yeah. We don't have any limitations for that yet. You can totally go off screen with this. All right. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes. Yes, we do. yes, right now we don't have any limit for where the character can go. You can just totally walk the character right off screen. But we can make those limits really easily. So if you don't want your character to go off screen, the easiest thing to do is just make more if statements. So the screen again it goes from 0 to 128. So if px is less than 0, px equals 0. And that will stop it from going off screen to the left. And then we can do the same thing like if px is greater than 128, then set it to 128. Mm -hmm. What? Yes. Yes, here, let me, let me add some spaces. And then if we change all of these values to PY, then that will also stop us from going off screen in the top, in the bottom. And then you can see now that I've done that, it will sort of stop me in the corner. Oh, it drops, it still draws the character. Yep. Because the character, I guess the other thing is if we really want to stop it earlier, your character is four pixels by four pixels. So if we just change this to four, four, for four, so we're adding four to the lower number, subtracting four from the higher number. Yes, control Z undoes. Yeah, no, I think what you're referring about this is that it's like Emacs or like a terminal, but you click into what you want It is, again, designed to make things emulate the older times, but without all of the frustrations that came along with it. Because the character is four pixels by four pixels, so we just subtract four from each number to bring in bring the walls in slightly closer. Because again, the character px and py we have set to the center of your character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone need some help? Because once we get done with this, the next step is going to be to add the coins to collect, and that's going to be a bit more of a complicated process, so I want to make sure everyone is all set with moving their character around the screen. All right, this is going to be where things start to get a bit tricky, <laughs> because we are going to be dealing with tables. If you've worked with lists or arrays, tables are somewhat similar, but they're a bit more complicated, and there's a few more things you can do with them. They're a really important part of Lua, and so this is going to be important to listen up on. So first off, we will create a table, and we'll just call it coins. Tables should be on the first page of your cheat sheet on the bottom left corner. Yep. And... Um, the most important thing you can do with a table, well, there's a few important things you can do with them, but one of them is it's like an array and you can add new elements onto it. And so what we're going to do here for coins is the best way to do it is to actually make a table of tables. So we'll have one large table, coins, which contains all of our individual coins. And then within that table, a single coin is itself another table that contains two values, an X position and a Y position. So like, how about we just manually do this right now? So coins, 
equals a table, and then inside that table, we'll put two coins to begin with. Um, x equals 32, y equals 32, just to give some example positions. Okay, so the outer curly braces here is one table, and then these are tables nested inside of that first table. And so you can see we're sort of tables can represent different data structures in other languages. Like the outer one is an array, all of the things are indexed, whereas the inner one is a dictionary where you can access these variables by their name. And so tables are like your dictionaries or your objects or your arrays or whatnot. They're very versatile. So yes, difficult to keep track of, but if you can, they're quite useful. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to iterate over this table, and for each coin, we're going to do something with it. So, for example, let's try drawing each of these coins. Oops. So down here, we're going to create a special type of for loop for C. The C can be any random variable you want, as long as it's not being used by anything else. It's just a variable in all coins. And all coins creates an iterator that will loop over the table you give it. So in this case, it will loop over the coins. And again, that one, I think, that one is in the loops section. You can see like the third example in the loops section is an example of a for loop of this type. Mm, okay. Yep. So is there, is there other way, instead of all, is there like other options? There's a few other options. Like for example, there's i pairs which you can have another element i, which will give you the loop index as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or if like a table, if you have a name associated with each of them, you can just do regular pairs, and then this i will be like, if we were to do four i pairs of this value, I mean, four pairs of this value, then the i would be equal to x, and the um, C would be equal to 32. Ig ignore that. We're just going to use the simple all, which gives you a single value that you'll be looping over, which in this case is the coin itself. So this will iterate through both coins in the table. And then for each of those coins, we want to, of course, draw the coin on screen. So right now we're just going to do a simple circ fill, but you can do any of the methods that I showed you to draw something. We'll do circ fill. And then we want our x position, which is going to be c dot x, where that dot x is because we have named this value x. And then c dot y, if you've used objects before, this syntax should be familiar. And then we'll just get a small circle, and we'll give it color 10 is good yellow color. OK. And then if we run the code from here, then you can see that we have two little coins appearing on the screen. Can't do anything with them yet, but you can at least see them on screen. And they're above, they're on top of my character? Yes, because the draw statement just draws everything in order. So first it clears the screen, then it draws the character, then it draws the coins. And so if I were to like bring this block of code up above this line, it would draw the character on top of the coins. Actually, that's probably a good thing. Play on yes, because the player should be on top. I mean, theoretically here, once we start being able to collect the coins, then if you're touching a coin, the coin should be on. <laughs> so you won't really overlap it for too long. But yeah. Yes, the coins itself look like this. Okay, can I help anyone out with this? Okay, are we ready to start collecting the coins? Are you ready for me to start? Okay, yeah. so we're going to want to, to collect the coins. We're also going to want to iterate through all of the coins again. And for this, we will just use the same for loop that we created previously. So like we can even take the whole for loop in the draw statement, copy it up to the updates section. And 
No, this is to collect the coins. Oh, okay. Yep. So, first off, in order to collect the coins, we need to see if the player is actually touching the coin. And to do this, we're going to use the simplest type of collision detection, which is just pretend everything's a circle. There is no inbuilt functions for collision detection in Pico 8. You have to do everything yourself, but the math is pretty easy, especially for doing circles. So, in order to see if two circles are touching, you just need to see if the distance between them is less than the sum of the radii. And so, for um, distance, we'll do uh, variable dist is equal to, and this is just going to be Pythagorean theorem, square root of uh, difference in x squared plus difference of y squared. So square root is the square root function. And then this would be px minus c dot x squared plus py minus c dot y squared. And then this will set the distance variable equal to the distance between your two, between the player and this particular coin. And now, for my game, I'm using a... Yes. For my game, I'm using the coins have a radius of two, and the player has a radius of about four. So that would be a combined radius of six. So that would be if um, distance is less than six, then, and you can tweak that number six if necessary. Bigger numbers will make the coins easier to collect. Smaller numbers will mean you need to be pretty precise. What if I use a sprite, a standard mm -hmm. sprite for both? If you use a standard sprite of the standard size for both, and since sprites have a radius of four pixels, then it would be eight. Okay. Yep. And now, from here, we can do a few different things with the coin. And the easiest thing to do with the coin is to just make the coin move to a new random position. So that way, we don't, we'll take care of um, deleting it later, but this is just the easiest thing to do. So c.x equals rmd creates a random number from 0 to 128, because we're putting in 128. And then that R&D function is in the math section of the Pico 8 cheat sheet on the front side. And that's, it includes zero? Yes, it so includes, okay. starts at zero, it excludes 128, and it will generate a decimal value. But because we're doing positions, it doesn't, we don't really need to worry about the fact that it's giving us decimal values. Okay. Yep. You, S S rand is, um, sets the seed for a random number generator. So if you want it to be consistent each game. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this should work. If I do this and I try and collect a coin, it will go somewhere new. All right. Is everyone at this stage? Let's move on to multiplying our fund by multiplying the number of coins we've got. <laughs> so this is one way of generating a table. This is just doing it manually, but we can also add values into the table using code. All right, so adding in elements to our table, let us create a different type of for loop. And for loops in Lua are very versatile and very easy. So if I want to create, say, 20 more random coins for i equals 1 to 20. There we go. Oops. And that will run the code inside of this block 20 times. Nice and easy. And you can use the value i in order to get what the value of it is for that iteration. But we don't need to do that here. We can do. We want to add a new element to our coins table. So the way to do that is add the name of the table we're trying to add to, in this case, coins, and the element we're adding, which in this case will be just a new coin with what set x, we'll do another random position.
and then make sure you look at the parentheses and end statements here because we've got an open bracket here, so we need a close bracket here, and then we have an open parentheses here, so we need to close parentheses here. That's something that I've been tripped on multiple times when trying to nest add statements in this way. But if we do this, then this should add 20 new coins in random positions on the board. And so if we give this a run, then we can see we've got a bunch of coins everywhere. Um, here, just a tip for like advanced stuff like that. If you hit Control P, it brings up a little debug menu, and you can yes, and you can see um, the first number is how many frames per second out of what the target frames per second is, and then the second and third numbers are what percentage of CPU utilization it's using. So right now it is barely using any CPU utilization. Um, let me save this project, um, let me just find a random game, um, I'm just finding a random game, like this game looks like it has some more complicated sprites, no this game's actually running pretty fine, you can see that one's using 26% of CPU utilization, and as I keep playing the game then that number will fluctuate slightly. Yes, that one runs 60 frames per second. And the way to do that is if we um, load the day one demo again. If you really want the game to run 60 frames per second, literally all you do is add the number 60 right here. It only works for 30 or 60 frames per second. Those are the only two numbers, but you can do that. And the game. Yeah, there's a reason the default is 30 frames per second. <laughs> And you can also see that it call, calls that update function twice as often now, so you're effectively moving at twice the speed. So I would recommend leaving it at just 30 frames per second. It looks, looks better. But there's other types of polish we can do. So if we want to do that, then this is one of my favorite tips for game development in Pico 8, just to make things look cooler. Put some acceleration into your character. So. We're going to add two new variables here, PDX oops, and PDY. And those stand for player delta X and delta Y, which will represent how much the X position and the Y position are changing each frame. And so down here, oops, instead of directly changing our X and Y positions, uh, just change this so it's all the same. We want to change P D X and actually manually. S no, we'll do adding because that's the more fun way. We'll add or subtract in this case a small value, 0 0.5. And so that means that it will accelerate. Yes. Yes, subtracting to go to left, adding to go to right. Same as usual, just make sure you're setting P D X instead of P X and make sure its value is smaller unless you want it to like wildly accelerate way too far. Yes, that's a number that I found works relatively well. You can fiddle around with these values. It's a lot more fun to fiddle around with these values. And then to actually manifest those, then you just do px plus equals pdx. So again, we're changing the x position every frame by the delta x and then PY plus equals PDY. And then finally, we want to have some friction in there. And so, yep, PX times equal 0 0.85. So it will reduce by a factor of 85% every frame. And if you've done everything right, player movement should now look a little, whoa, why did it snap up to that quarter? Not sure. But you can see the player feels a little more smooth to control. It actually like accelerates and decelerates as it's moving around. Is this curve? Yes. So it's kind of like more actual yes. rather than just doing Yes. Yes. Instead of directly doing it, you put a bit of acceleration in and it feels more fun. Now why did it snap to the top corner? 
P. It snaps to the top corner because I put the wrong values here. P, D, Y, and P, D, X. That's what you need to do right there. I put the wrong numbers in. Yes, animation. Player animations first. Trivially easy. Yes. So, um, yeah. Yes. Um, but in our code, we're doing the collision detection with the radiuses. Correct. So um, for the flags, like uh, da, 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 four finger swipe, this way. Yeah. Nope. These lines. So, like this game, for example, you can see that's the map editor. We aren't using the map editor here, but if you are using the map editor, then you can have special code to like collide with things that way. You don't need that for this game. That's for bigger games. We'll go over the map editor next time. Yes. So, to make animations, it is going to be easiest if all of the sprites you're animating are all in adjacent numbers. So, like, we've got your player character at 1, so it will be easiest to make another animation at 2. So if you have like a coin or something at two, then you can very easily do control X to cut it and then control V to paste it somewhere else. And then update the index. Yes, make sure you update the index. You can see the new index right here. So I'm just gonna make the animation. It's just gonna be like a really simple, oops. Simple enough. Okay. Every, everyone have a whale well sprite here that they want to animate. So, in order to update that in the code, we're using a number to represent the animation, the what index of sprite to draw. So we can just change that number with code. So we'll create a new variable. We'll call it p anim for p animation index. And we'll set it to 1 for most of us, since our first sprite is located at 1. Then over here, down here where we're, can I scroll better? Thank you. Where we're drawing the character, instead of setting it to 1, we'll do p anim. So you can set the variable to whatever you want. This is just what I use to help remember it. Yep. And then up here to change it, um, there's a new special function we'll do. If time, time will give you how many seconds since you started the game. And we'll do modulo one. So effectively, modulo, you all, do you all know the operation? This one effectively says every one second. So if the number of seconds is easily, evenly divisible by one, then update the animation index. And then since we only have two sprites of animation in my example, we can do if p parentheses p anim is greater than two, then we reset it back to one. And then if I do that, then I have messed up. It's going every frame. So the module will oh. be every frame. Equals zero. That's what it is, because that's if the remainder is equal to zero. Hi. Are you here for the Pico 8? I wanted to catch you, but I just got out of the class. OK, yeah. Sorry about that, then. I'll give you a bit of stuff after this lesson to get you caught up. We've already done a lot of it. But since you're here, Yes, we've got full recording available. I don't know how much of the recording is able to pick up. I haven't tried this before, and I have not been paying attention to staying close to this. Okay. So but basically, animation is just manually changing yes, the index of the... Yes, we're just manually changing the index. And is that, for, is that how you do it typically? Yes, that is how you do it typically, yes. It's a lot of manual work. But, I mean, here's the results. Yes. And then we can change that to make it faster, like we want it every half second.
then theoretically, yeah, that's every half second right there. And that's what that looks like. I honestly, yeah, I do something that's slightly more complex but doesn't run into those issues. We'll just do n equals zero, and then every frame will do n plus equals one. And then now, yeah, so instead of counting seconds, you count frames. And because that's always the whole number, it's not going to run into floating point issues. If you do control U on any statement, then it will automatically return you to the command line mode, but it will give you a definition of what you just did. And that's control U. Yeah, so like if I type in print and then mouse over it and hit control U, then it will give us the definition for print. That's convenient. Yeah, so documentation is somewhat built into the system. It is typically best to have some external documentation as well, either that chink sheet or like the Pico8 wiki is, it is fandom based, so boo, but it does its job. <laughs> Actually, I just realized, I was like, how do I explain how the game slowdown looks like? But I realized a good way to do that. Too many. <laughs> we'll put 2,000 coins in. Oops. Uh, it's not slowing down. <laughs> it's still running at only 75% utilization. Um, it probably wouldn't do any difference because of the way the game works. Oh, no, that does. That does. Yeah, that, you can see it slowing down now. Yep. Yep. And again, in the game like this, the update is still being called every single frame, but we are skipping half of our draw calls. So you can see that it's still moving at 60 FPS speed, even if I'm only actually getting 30 FPS on screen. And then we can we can take even more frames off of this by like, I don't know, 6,000. We're still, oh my goodness. Why does it still say 30 FPS? Well, this does not look like 30 FPS. But yeah, don't push the engine to its limits. It doesn't like it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Control P is um, what turns on and off the debug console. <laughs> He's consumed. We may need to. We may need to recolor things. Hmm. I don't know. Um, please look away if you have any epilepsy or something that could be caused by. Does anyone have anything that could be caused by flashing colors? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> what does get back down to a normal amount of coins? But yeah, you can see just how easy it is to mess around with this and do whatever you want. It is fun. We've got 10 minutes left before the official end time of this. Is there anything else anyone wants me to show them or anything else anyone wants help with? Ah, keyboard. Um, Pico White has a very limited input scheme. It will only register up, down, left, right, O, X, which... Um, oh, okay, so WASD is not happening. No, it is not. Um, one second, let me just open up a game. Here, here's the control menu. Here's the control menu in game. Oops, nope. So here's what the controls look like in game. So you can see that up, down, left, right is my cursors. And then player two, for whatever reason, is SFED. It is one offset from WAS. I don't know. It is the dumbest thing. Yes, so I would recommend if you ever want to play a PQ8 game that needs two players, just plug in two joysticks and it will automatically register both of them and you can use the joysticks and then A and B. It automatically does that. If you plug in a joystick, up, down, left, right, and then Z, um, X and Z, those will automatically map onto the joystick. You do not need to do anything special in the code. Oh, 
But what if I want to check for player two in here? Like, let's say, how do I code for player two? Then you just add an additional number after the button statement. Uh, one second. Um, I think I just um, removed some of the work recently. I think I just removed the past half hour of work. Save your things often, people. Don't do what I did. <laughs> I just lost the past half hour of work on the game. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but if we go to button and we hit control U, then you can see that you have an optional player number after the input number. So if you um, do one a day, then it will detect player two's input, and if you do zero, which is the default, it detects player one's input. So yes, and again, those are your only things, so the game can really only support up to two player games. Particle effects are, there is no inbuilt particle effects. Oh, so it would be similar to how you do animations? It would be similar to how you do animations, or we could do it another way. So I'm just gonna do this really quickly, try and follow along. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add another table, particles. Oops. And that will be where we keep track of our particle effects. And so you can just create any functions you want, obviously. Do it outside of the init and update functions, of course. But I'll do function add particle and x, y, and we'll just do x and y. And then we'll add particles Oops. and then we'll do x equals x y equals y dx equals random number one, uh, hi uh, at eight yeah, we'll be out by eight thank you okay gotta hurry up <laughs> minus one two R and D two minus one, that will return a number from negative one to positive one, and it can return a decimal. Um, actually, let's make the particle effects even splatterier. Six minus three. So what is six minus three again? That gives you a random number from zero to six, but then we reduce it by three, so it goes from negative three to positive three effectively. Oh. That will be, um, we'll do a random spread on the particle effects. Oh, okay. Yep, and do the same thing for dy, and then size, we'll do two plus one. So the particle's initial size can be anywhere from two to three. So this is all, I'm gonna show you what I'm using all of these numbers for later. I just sort of gave you the values without any reason why. So what we will do is down here, We'll do 4p in all particles. Do circ fill p dot x, p dot y, p dot size, and then color. We can just set the color to like, I'll do golden particles, which is 10. You can do blood, which is eight. <laughs> and then I said not to do any watch you can hear, but I'm going to do watch you can hear just for the sake of time p dot x plus equals p dot dx, p dot y plus equals p dot dy, and then p dot size minus equal 0 0.1, and then if p dot size is less than or equal to 0, then delete from the particles table p. Yep delete the particle, and that's delete the name of the table you want to delete from it, and then the element you want to delete. So ideally, you would have everything from mm -hmm. the first line in a separate loop to update. Correct, yes. And then in order to add these particles, then like when you collect a coin here, then four i equals one, 20 will just spawn 20 random particles. Mm -hmm. just you collect one coin? Yeah, why not? 20 particles for one coin. Have it a celebration. Oh, like a bunch of tiny little circles. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And there's a lot of different ways you can do particles. This is just one potential way to do it. This is the way I like doing it. But that is not the correct positioning. 
<laughs> what? Is, oh, it's spawning it at the new position where the coin appears. Uh, oh, you just gotta change the Here, there we go. Yeah, we may want to decrease the speed. I think I made the speeds too high. <laughs> yes. So the code to set up the particle adder is this one right here. Yeah. And then I don't know the best way to show it all at once because the code to actually. I'm just going to take that guy's out of that. OK. We'll update the code. I don't want to rush you. Let's see. Yeah, I did that. Yep. And then down here um, is this for loop right here is what we use to draw the particles. Yeah. The middle section is just how you add particles, and that's just a really basic 20 times we add a particle. Uh, okay. Wait, Thank you. It's just the name of the function that we created earlier. Yep. Yep, or whatever exposition you want. I mean, technically, since we're doing it at the player, you could even replace these with px and py, since they should be about the same. But yeah. And then feel free to change any of the numbers to get different effects. Like, if you want the particles to be like even bigger, then we could do something really dumb like this. <laughs> 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 No, oh, we're going to destroy this computer. I'm sorry for your computer, but sacrifices must be made. <laughs> I needed different colors. Um, yes, one second. I got to try this. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> all righty and that is all that we have time for today so thank you all for coming i am hope everyone learned a lot today i'm glad you all could make it here please scan any of our qr codes if you want to leave me any feedback, and, feedback. yep we have our next pico 8 workshop is going to be um upstairs at the same time as this one in two weeks and we will be going over some more advanced stuff like platformer games, making a map, all that kind of stuff. And um, we, I will be hosting another workshop, I believe this room, next week. I believe it's this room. Check the VGA list server Discord or check posters that we'll probably have up and about. But I will be hosting a workshop on Game Maker this time. So if you want another 2D game engine it's got a bunch of different advantages and disadvantages to pico 8 so if you want some more skill set i highly recommend you stomp on by thank you very much for coming today thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. yes take some cheat sheets <laughs>